Hi, hi uh, this Paul here, could, uh, can everyone hear us? Could someone type a message? Thank you. Hi, can someone type a message if they can hear? Okay, thanks. Okay, I will just start. Um, I will, of course, I have to run off. I'll just start with the just the, the weekly updates. Sorry, uh, just have to run it down a bit. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, hi, hi. Uh, the, this is Paul here. Just run through the, the, the weekly highlights and just our basic, basic short-term views. Okay. Uh, in terms of the week 29, uh, in terms of the, the macro, obviously the, the market rally, there was some form of de-escalation by Donald Trump and China. As you all would know, uh, the tariffs on the 200 billion uh, imports from China uh, will uh, is only imposed five percent. Uh, sorry, ten percent until uh, end December. Then it resumes back to twenty five percent. So so there was some de escalation and China's retaliation was five to ten percent tariffs. Obviously, the next will be whether Trump moves on the two hundred and sixty seven billion. Uh, uh, because as as you may recall, he mentioned that if China retaliates, then he will impose tariffs on that two hundred sixty seven billion. So nothing has happened yet. Uh, but because he's, uh, Donald Trump is going to, to the United Nations, so not sure if he might meet uh, Xi Jinping there and maybe they could discuss something. But anyway, that's all speculation. Okay, uh, the other main macro highlight uh, last week was, of course, the 10 year treasuries. Uh, there are several year high, uh, sorry, the 11 year high, uh, sorry, the, the um, number there, it was 3.11. So, so uh, and also two year, two year yields are already at 10 year high. So we do see. Uh, uh, the treasury or interest rates creeping up uh, strong, stronger in, in the US. I will elaborate more on, on the themes later. Uh, in terms of corporate events last week, I guess just for discussion, I think we had that uh, there was a copy term acquisition by NTUC. Uh, we don't cover Kim Lee or, uh, or any of the coffee shops, but I guess this, mean, this is probably not good news because uh, I think basically the government is now a new competitor. As NTUC has mentioned that uh, they are going to they are, they want to ensure affordable and accessible food, so I guess we, we know what that means. That means it's going to be ch uh, cheaper food and, and at more compet there's going to be more comp competitive prices at, at the hawker store. Uh, in terms of the other copper event was Capital Land. They mentioned they've acquired three thousand plus of uh, multi-family homes. Uh, these in US terms, these are basically apartments. Uh, and this, uh, we are not too positive on this deal because I think the, the carry or the rental carry is not very positive. I mean, it's very thin. Uh, as you can see, the, they are acquiring this at about 5 to 5.5% uh, cap rate, whereas interest rate was uh, is around 4. And, and just so the, the difference between is maybe one percentage point is very thin, especially we are moving into a rising rate uh, environment. And also, we, we think that they are paying at a premium because they want to get some scale. And also, we're not sure how they're going to manage because you're looking at 3,800 units, which is obviously very difficult to... to how do you manage 3,800 uh, customers? So scaling up and managing such a, an asset class is always very challenging. The other un, uh, un, less clear is also uh, uh, multifamily has done well, uh, or basically the rental market in the US has done well because there has been a clear team after the global financial crisis of of uh, households renting versus buying. But it's, again, we're not sure whether this, this trend can actually uh, carry forward or the trend to rent versus buy is actually reversing. Uh, the other uh, corporate news was actually, uh, at least Samco Industries, there was a big surge in power prices uh, in three-year high. So if this could maintain, this could be a positive uh, for Samco Industries. Kuang uh, Che is on leave, so he will elaborate it on the, the following big, uh, um, uh, webinar. Uh, the other news just to mention is just that uh, Jardine Madison at least sold one of their insurance units and their 40 percent stakes about uh, US 200, 2 billion. Uh, there was also this news about Valuetronics. Uh, uh, anyway, there was a flood. In, uh, they had a conference call, but there was a flood and actually they've actually recovered most of their operations. Operations is back to normal. But uh, in the meeting, uh, more interesting was they did mention about the trade war impact. So far, the direct impact is about 10 percent of their exports go into the US and that is affected by the, the tariffs. Uh, and whatever's affected by the tariffs, they just mentioned that most of it, the customer will absorb, but there is some cost pressure because customers affected by the trade tariffs might ask them for some 
uh, some you know, cost, cost cuts, or, but at least at a very marginal uh, amount. But that's the situation. Uh, and if full-blown trade tariffs, I think 40% of, of, their, of their revenue will be exposed if all imports into China uh, are imposed tariffs. Uh, the other interesting thing is probably uh, most of the electronic companies based in China are now considering looking at moving uh, some production into Southeast Asia. It's not concrete, it's still very early stage, but that is the trend that we get in terms of responding to the trade wars, those manufacturers in China. They are looking at building some partnership in Southeast Asia to, so that they can, they can produce all of Southeast Asia to avoid the tariffs. Okay, in terms of a tactical stance, uh, I think uh, one thing to note is that there is a FOMC meeting, which they were obviously very high, almost 100% that they were raised uh, interest rates by another 25 basis points. But I think what it will be the focus is that the, in the monetary, in their statement, FOMC statement, whether they will remove this so-called uh, commodity stance. By removing this, the, the market might, might view this as they are coming closer to a neutral rate and they might actually be slowing down their uh, increasing interest rates. Uh, not this year, but I'm talking more like 2019 onwards. So this could actually have caused some US dollar weakness in the very near term. So uh, for us, the, in the near-term team will be at least, uh, uh, with the attention will be back to rising interest rates uh, because as you know, FMC will, 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 uh, the Fed will be raising interest rates and then we've got, so we're moving to a rising interest rate team at least in the very near term. And of course, the biggest beneficiary will be DBS. The other interesting thing with uh, Semcon Industries, uh, there was a note, but we'll elaborate later next week. But anyway, uh, we're beginning to get more positive about the stock. I think they are growing their portfolio of utilities into more renew re renewables in the longer term. And also, you, uh, that, so this is a growth segment for them. And also in the near term, you can see that Chinese uh, electricity demand is actually very strong. And also uh, India is turning around. In, uh, the final part, just on the uh, week ahead or weeks ahead, what to look out for this week uh, will be of, there is some news about of, of news on the at least on the oil front. You got the OPEC ministerial meeting, and then on the twenty sixth, Trump will be at the U, UN uh, talking about Iran. Obviously, he'll be complaining about Iran and probably will impose his sanctions. So this this could get some uplift for oil prices. Of course, the that we mentioned before, there's the inclusion of dairy farm into an STI, and then the US tariffs. And the final thing will be the FOMC meeting. Uh, some of the key things to vote will be like I mentioned earlier, the accommodative uh, wording. Uh, the dot plots in the in the Fed meeting, and also uh, interesting to see how the federal uh, the, the Fed uh, power actually the or the Fed chair actually talk what are his views on yield curve comments because uh, as Jeremy will elaborate later the yield curve is inverting so it'll be interesting to see how he views this and is he worried about this yeah uh, that's it for me thanks I will go back to the original uh, uh, itinerary uh, will be uh, Tara on S reads. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, so I'll be talking about our S reads for the month of September. So the S read index declined two point six percent year to date, and uh, on one month basis, it declined one percent. Current S read dividend yield is at five point three four percent, and uh, that translates to a yield spread of two hundred ninety six basis points, which is still below the negative one SD range. Uh, historical average has been at three hundred fifty nine basis points. So, from a yield and interest expense perspective, um, rising interest rates will continue to be a headwind uh, for S reads, as uh, especially as what Paul mentioned, there will be the upcoming uh, rate hike uh, sometime this week. Um, and uh, however, this does not necessarily lead to a doom and gloom situation as rental growth can be a mitigating tailwind. On the short end of things, uh, the three months saw is at close to 10 year highs at 1.65%. And uh, however, upon our assessment, uh, as 33 out of 40 of all S rates have at least 70% of their debt hedged on fixed interest rates, so higher near term financing costs are largely mitigated. So uh, just to give uh, a quick uh, subsec uh, snapshot of the different subsectors, uh, for retail, retail sales is still sluggish in Singapore and FMB index was also down. Uh, the bigger news is that CMT had acquired 70% uh, interest in Westgate Mall. So uh, currently, uh, uh, this had been reported under the Associates JV line. So um, 
upon completion of the acquisition, this would be fully under their portfolio. And we estimate that the acquisition will only be accretive to forward FY19 DPU if funded by at least 70% debt. You have uh, seen Moody's report downgrading their outlook on uh, CMT um, if they were to increase their gearing further. So current gearing for CMT is at 31.5% as at their latest quarter. And if, the, if they were to fully fund it with 100% debt for this acquisition, that would raise gearing to 36%. However, um, we do see um, the improvement in the gearing once uh, earnings accrue from the completion of Funan renovation sometime next year. And also to note that uh, Moody's had kept its uh, A2 rating on uh, CMT unchanged since 2016. For commercial, um, for there's a big, the bigger news is also affecting CCT. So HSBC signed a one-year lease extension with CCT at their current premises for 36% increase in rental, which pushes the NPI yield from 4% to 6%. And... Um, so this one year lease extension is from next year, April, April 2019 to April 2020. So after April 2020, HSBC will be relocating to MBFC Tower 2. So CCT had released an announcement with regards to this. So among the options for HSBC building after the relocation would be AI and possible divestment as well. Other than that, OUE Commercial Rate uh, will also be buying the office component of OUE Downtown from their sponsor. And uh, this translates to about a 5% cap rate. So this is in line with the compressing cap rates as we have seen in the healthy office transactions from the last quarter. And for industrial, we are seeing, seeing a burgeoning demand for industrial space. Uh, Facebook had announced an upcoming 1.4 billion data center in Singapore. So this is really huge. It's about 1.7 million square feet, which is more than six times of capital DC REITs combined GFA in Singapore. ESR REIT and Viva Industrial Trust uh, proposed merger had been approved by unit holders at both sites. And this is just pending court approval. Uh, Ascender Street had also announced a successful private placement of about $452 million, which was 2.2 times subscribed. And for hospitality, uh, RevPass are looking good. RevPass Ref is now at more than 2.5 year highs. And this had been trending upwards on both higher occupancy and average room rate. So historically for the month of July and August, these two months had clocked the highest occup monthly occupancy rates for the past three years from 2014 to 2017. So for the next data showings, uh, we can expect to see good REFPA growth as well for August. So overall, we remain neutral on s sector. So I had mentioned earlier from a valuation point of things, uh, s is s are still currently trading below the negative one SE level since uh, the GFC. And uh, we we uh, remain selective on the subsectors. We like the office and hospitality subsector due to tapering supply and also, as I mentioned, the compressing cap rates in the office sector in Singapore and uh, improving REFPA um, for hospitality. We are cautious on Singapore retail subsector with declining retail sales and shopper footfall in Singapore. And also, um, this for industrial, there's a slower than expected net absorption of industrial space. For our bottom-up view, uh, this was unchanged from our last report. Um, the REITs that can better weather through the rising interest rates environment are those with low gearing, high interest coverage, low, long-weighted average debt to maturity, and a high proportion of debt on fixed interest rates. So these include uh, REITs such as CRCT and Capo DC REIT both of which we have accumulated calls on. On the right is the, is the table of uh, all the REITs under our coverage. So just to flash through the s -REITs universe, which we have at the back of the report. So you can focus on the colored columns, which represent the more critical attributes, which in regards to the rising interest rate environment. So the green uh, the green figures represent the better than average figures for each respective column and vice versa for the red figures.
moving on to first read. So we have seen in the news and um, first read's announcement that there have been some changes for the ownership of uh, their manager and um, as well as first read. So uh, just to note that the trust structure of first read remains unchanged. So as you can see on the left, that uh, structure remains unchanged. Uh, the only thing that's changed is the, the changing of hands on the ownership side. So uh, I think you can focus on the figure on the right, which is a very good graphical representation on what's going to happen pre and post acquisition. So first step, uh, OU Limited will be uh, acquiring 60% and OU Lipo Healthcare will be acquiring 40% of the manager, uh, Bo Spirit, from Lipo Karawachi's uh, holding company for about 39.6 million. And the second step, OU Lipo Healthcare will be acquiring 10.63% of units in first read from Bridgewater, which is also a subsidiary of Lipo Karawachi via OHI for 102.7 million. So upon completion of this transaction, OU Lipo Healthcare and Lipo Karawachi will each have 10.63% stake in first read. Currently, Lipo Karawachi has about 29.7% uh, stake in first read. So we see this uh, as uh, quite positive for first read as the approximately 145 million Singapore dollars, including fees and expenses, um, that would flow through to Lipo Karachi because it's all it will all be settled in cash. So this cash infusion um, is good for the sponsor as you would have seen in our previous reports in first read, we have always pointed out the credit issues at the sponsor side as they're not just a sponsor, they're also the sponsor tenant and a, a, rel and a really large one at that. They had accounted for about 83% of their G or first read's GRI asset uh, FY17 results. So um, once they get this uh, cash infusion from their divestment of stake in the, in the manager as well as first read, this could ease their cash flow status and potentially also improve receivables at first read provided they, uh, some of this cash does flow through to paying the rentals to first read. And then uh, what's really good from this um, transaction would be uh, that the, they would get a new rofer pipeline from OU Lipo Healthcare. So this includes healthcare assets in Japan. They have some nursing homes in Japan as well as hospitals in China and Malaysia. And uh, this the existing rofer pipeline from Lipo Karawachi, which um, would remain. So um, this is where they had been getting the, the Indonesia hospitals from. So um, that would still remain. And just a flow through from that point, um, there would be potential improvement in tenant concentration risks, provided that they, um, assuming that they do continue acquiring properties from OU Lipo Healthcare. So over time, um, Lipo Karawachi would cease to be the single biggest lessee of their property. So in a sense, their uh, tenant profile would be diversified and will not be largely re reliant on just one uh, tenant. So overall, we maintain neutral with an unchanged target price of $1.31. We did not actually make any changes to our forecast as this transaction does not impact the REIT operationally. And also the transaction is pending approval from the OU Lipo Healthcare shareholders as well as the MES and is expected to be completed in November. Our target price translates to a forward yield of 7.2% and a price to book of 1.12 times. So I'm on to Jeremy to talk about the Philip Money Recession Tracker. Hi, good morning everyone. Jeremy speaking here. So uh, I'll briefly run through uh, some updates uh, in the US market, uh, mainly from our recession tracker point of view, uh, at least what we saw in the month of August up to last week. Uh, as of now, we are still seeing, uh, in terms of the recession tracker wise, it's still advising us to stay on the risk on side. And I'll elaborate more in the following slide. 
So here's just an update of the recession tracker, uh, at least for the month of August. Again, for those that haven't been following this recession tracker, uh, basically it measures a list of indicator. So uh, our recession tracker consists of a 17 indicator that can be separated into two broad groups, uh, market-based data market-based data as well as uh, economic-based data. And the reason why we are tracking this thing over here is because right now we are in the second longest economic expansion in history uh, for the US market. Uh, to be more specific, 110 months uh, of economic uh, expansion since uh, GFC. And to put things in the context, uh, the longest economic expansion happened in the 1990s decade that lasted around 119 months. So probably for us to even uh, outrun that level, uh, we could still see another nine more months of uh, economic expansion and further growth to the equity market before we uh, exceed and head into unprecedented kind of uh, territory. But as of now, uh, definitely we are in a late stage economic cycle, which is why we are pretty concerned about a downturn. But looking at the recession tracker right now, at least in the near term outlook wise, we still remain pretty bullish on the US equity market. And probably just to highlight, uh, bring our attention to this particular column over here. Uh, this is the column that shows us the most recent data set uh, for the month of August. And as you can see over here, we are seeing more greens than red. And basically telling us that uh, we are seeing further improvement for the month of August as compared to July. So probably just to highlight a few more noteworthy uh, indicators that stand out in the month of August. Uh, sentiment indicators such as uh, ISM manufacturing PMI as well as uh, CB consumer confidence uh, all have hit a new multi-decade high in the month of August. And then uh, some other noteworthy ones are like your industrial production number uh, also hit another new multi-decade high uh, in the month of August. And then in the labor market, we are also seeing further growth. Uh, unemployment claim last week actually hit a high of, uh, hit a low of 205,000 weekly claims. And that's actually the lowest level since 1987. Uh, I will show more in a while in terms of graphical chart uh, how, what it means. But right now, as you can see over here, as of now, the indicators are still uh, pretty much in their bullish territory and we have yet to see them triggering their bearish signal uh, as shown by this particular column over here. Uh, the highlight over here that I only mentioned is the VIX index. Uh, it triggered its threshold back in a, uh, February of uh, this year. But since triggering that uh, level of 50 in uh, early February, uh, we have actually subsided off that high. And right now, uh, the VIX index is trading around 12. Uh, which is a pretty positive setup, uh, at least in the near term. Uh, so as you can see over here, August performance for the US market, uh, the Dow was up 2.16%, the S&P was up 3%, and then the strongest of all, the NASDAQ uh, tech heavy sector, uh, NASDAQ 100 was up 5.78%. And this is in line with what our recession tracker was advising last month, uh, again, a risk on help approach. And we have been calling for this risk on move uh, since last year. So as of now, we are still expecting this bullish momentum to continue at least for another four to five more months out uh, before our 210 spread actually hits into inversion. Uh, I'll explain more also uh, in the following slides what I mean by that. But as of now, near-term outlook, we are still very bullish uh, on the equity market. So before I dive into uh, the indicators uh, to highlight some of the negatives as well as positive, uh, probably just to bring attention right now to the news that is currently in the spotlight, uh, mainly the trade war uh, between US and China. And probably one good way to measure uh, whether we are seeing further escalation or de-escalation of the trade war is to look at this particular cross-currency pair. Uh, this is the US dollar to the offshore yuan uh, cross-currency pair. And what we see is uh, this bold horizontal line over here is the seven psychological wrong number. Uh, what we feel is that this level is uh, highly uh, defended by the Chinese government. And as you can see over here, uh, somewhere in 2016, late 2016 and early 2017 was when uh, the dollar CMH pair actually got close to that seven psychological round number. And we can see the PBOC actually defended that level pretty uh, firmly with uh, monetary policy. Uh, I'll explain in a while what kind of monetary policy that the PBOC set back then that caused the appreciation of the Chinese yuan against the USD. And we are seeing the similar kind of uh, implementation of that move right now. So uh, just to bring attention right now to this particular point, on 24th August, uh, the People's Bank of China, which is the Central Bank of uh, China, uh, we implemented this thing called the counter cyclical factor uh, in setting the midpoint pricing of the uh, Chinese yuan uh, on a day to day basis. And that particular move was seen by a market uh, participant as a move that they are willing to halt this recent devaluation of the yuan uh, and bring them into a period of stabilization and a period of uh, appreciation. And probably just to give you a guide of how to uh, analyze this chart, uh, what we think is uh, anything. Uh, 
for a trade escalation to play out is uh, if we do get a movement to the upside above 7, I think that will kind of uh, be a good barometer for trade escalation. But on the flip side of things, if this dollar C and H pack continues to fall lower, which means uh, appreciation period of uh, offshore yuan, uh, that should spell well for uh, the escalation kind of scenario, which is what we are seeing, I think, right now. So like I mentioned again, on 24th August, the PBOC actually implemented this thing called the counter cyclical factor, uh, mainly uh, to kind of stabilize the Chinese yuan. Uh, one good way to actually explain this is uh, by adjusting the counter cyclical factor, they are actually placing more weight on the economic uh, data that is coming out from China to set the uh, offshore yuan. And with the Chinese data still remaining pretty uh, decently on the upside, uh, that should bode well for further stabilization for the Chinese yuan. And in the near term, we do expect the US dollar to CNH pair to fall to the downside and that should continue to spell uh, further de-escalation and trade war as China kind of uh, move back away from using its currency to uh, kind of uh, combat the tariff that is implemented by US. So again, some backstory here. So the depreciation that we see here in the Chinese Yuan since uh, late March, this period over here all the way until somewhere in early August, that is actually a 10% uh, move of devaluation deliberately done by China to combat the uh, uh, tariff that's being implemented by US. Uh, we are probably seeing a reversal of that move right now with the most recent implementation of this counter cyclical factor by the PBOC. Uh, to put things in context, the first time the PBOC actually implemented this uh, counter cyclical factor, that was uh, the period over here back in May, end May of 2017. Uh, this vertical line was when the PBOC actually implemented this thing called the counter cyclical factor. And throughout this period over here until January of 2018, uh, that was when the PBOC ended this counter cyclical factor. Uh, you can see over here during this whole period, the Chinese yuan actually appreciated around 8.2%. Uh, mainly due to this uh, implementation of uh, aggressive monetary policy set by the Chinese uh, central bank. So we do expect as long as the counter cyclical factor is in place uh, for the Chinese market uh, moving forward, I think uh, in terms of the outlook wise for Chinese yuan, it should uh, continue to stabilize moving forward and uh, we should continue to see this USD to CNH pair falling to the downside, which should continue to spell for the de-escalation uh, from the trade wars perspective and that should work well for both the uh, U.S. equity market as well as the Chinese equity market. Uh, probably just to highlight again uh, some technical side of things. Uh, the weekly RSI, uh, this is on the weekly time frame, so the bottom panel here shows the relative strength index and just to highlight some interesting uh, uh, events that we actually noted. So that whenever the RSI actually came into overbought territory above 70, uh, I'll mark, uh, mark up a few examples over here. The one over here in 83, 78 and 79, you can see eventually when the RSI hits into extreme overbought condition, a correction lower in the uh, dollar C and H pair tends to happen. So we had three past experience of that particular movement whereby overbought condition actually caused the market to actually hit into a nosedive for the dollar C and H pair. Uh, we are seeing a similar replay right now with the recent deliberate devaluation of Chinese yuan pair. Uh, somewhere around, I think in uh, July, uh, August each period was when we saw the RSI hitting a half of 81. And since then, you can see the RSI kind of subsided to the downside. And just using some past example over here, uh, with the most recent implementation of the counter cyclical factor, uh, it's pretty highly likely that we are going to see further downside for this dollar to CNH pair, uh, which means uh, further strength in the uh, offshore yuan. So continue to watch this space. If this plays out, uh, the equity market should kind of uh, enjoy some bullish sentiment, uh, at least moving forward. So right now, I'll just cover more on what the recession tracker is showing. Uh, the first two slides that I will show here will uh, show some negativity here, and then the following slides will highlight some of the positive uh, indicators. So in terms of negative-wise, this is one of the flashing uh, alarm bells that we are kind of noting right now. Uh, this is the VIX index at the top panel, and then the bottom panel shows you the uh, VIX futures net positioning from the speculator's uh, perspective. So what we saw was, uh, at least historically, uh, all the way back to 2012. You can see the horizontal line there marks a point whereby uh, the net short position hit a high of 110,000 contracts. And what we notice that, uh, at least from a speculator's perspective, whenever the VIX futures positioning hits uh, below 100 negative 10,000 contracts, that is the point whereby it's setting up for a massive short squeeze within the VIX futures as well as the VIX index. So I'll mark up some vertical lines over here. Since 2012, we have nice uh, examples of the short squeeze happening. Uh, the vertical lines are the examples of short squeeze. 
uh, you can see over here 100 negative 10,000 contracts leading to a 42% spike in the VIX index. Same one over here in August leading to 42% spike. And then the two most recent one in uh, August of 2016 and 2017 whereby we saw a similar move of 31% and 48% uh, as the net speculator positioning hit below 110,000 contracts. And then the biggest one of all is the one that happened this year, uh, late January, early February, where we saw the VIX index actually spiking around 330% over a time span of two weeks. Uh, the implication to the equity market is uh, we saw the S&P 500 index actually uh, tumbling around 12% during the same time horizon. And again, it was being won by the net speculator positioning that was building up all the way since uh, April, May, each period of 2017. Uh, you can see this big highlighted region is the point whereby we saw net speculators are actually shorting the VIX futures hand over fees during this period. And we are talking about like nine whole months of shorting of the VIX futures, uh, signaling over complacency from the speculators' point of view. Uh, to put things into perspective, you can see the net positioning actually hit a massive short amount of 175,000 contracts, which was unprecedented uh, historically. So all in, it's just a matter of time before the short squeeze kind of uh, popped the market. And we actually got that in early February, but by the VIX index spike, 330%. So keep that at the back of our head. Uh, with the recent move in the VIX futures, as well as the positioning side of things, you can see we are back to that red line again. Uh, I've highlighted this arrow here, whereby we actually deep into that danger zone again in terms of uh, speculators uh, shorting the VIX futures uh, at a massive level. So right now, the VIX futures positioning stands at negative 120,000 contracts uh, in a similar range of what we saw in uh, April to the whole period of December of 2017. I think uh, in terms of what this is showing, it's again setting up for a short squeeze, probably in the likes of 2017, but uh, we wouldn't know when exactly the short squeeze might happen. Because for example, this whole period here, it took the market nine whole months before we actually saw that short squeeze taking the VIX index up about 330%. So this is just one of the uh, negative things that we kind of uh, noted for our recession tracker that it's setting up for a short squeeze. But probably in terms of the near-term outlook-wise, uh, as long as the VIX index trade nicely below this immediate ceiling of 20, uh, since April of this year, we have been trading pretty calmly below 20. Uh, in the near-term outlook, as long as uh, the VIX index stays pretty nicely within this range, I think the equity market should continue to do fine. And moving forward, I think we just continue to watch this space to see if uh, there is any massive selling uh, con that is continuing to build within the speculator side of things. And that should be uh, what is on top of our investors' mind to monitor in the near term. Another negative thing that is worth uh, noting is this thing, the 210 spread, which basically measures the U curve. Uh, what we see is, at least in the month of August, we actually hit a new 52-week low, uh, 183 basis point for the month of August. And uh, all in, in terms of base case scenario-wise, uh, from what we see, we do expect uh, at least if the flattening trend were to continue, uh, the market could still easily take four to five more months before the 210 spread actually hits into the danger zone of a zero, whereby that is when the inversion of the U curve would happen. So we can just explain how we got the four to five months uh, target range. Uh, you can see over here, the two highlighted region over here shows you the period where the 210 spread actually flattens around 21 basis point. That is the amount of time that it took for the market to flatten 21 basis point during that period. And one good example over here also, the point over here back in 2005 when the 210 spread was trading also at around 21 basis point. Uh, it took around five months before the 210 spread falls into inversion. So approximately, at least based off our base case scenario, uh, the market could still easily take four to five more months of uh, further flattening before the 210 spread hits into inversion. And from that point on, then I think in terms of uh, market outlook wise, that is when probably the market will be in some jittery kind of a state. But again, just to highlight, uh, in terms of the implication to the equity market, the rate highlighted vertical straps over here are the recessionary period in US. And as you can see over here, I mark up the point pretty nicely. Uh, historically, uh, despite the 210 spread actually falling into inversion, uh, the market will still easily take one year of uh, lag time before the recession kicks in. So with our base case example right now, uh, probably early next year is when we will see the inversion of the U curve. But even falling into the inversion part, uh, it could still easily take the market one full year before uh, we see the recession kick in. So in terms of that to happen, probably uh, late 2019 is when that might happen for the recession to kick in. And so the near-term outlook for the US equity market, we still remain pretty bullish until the 210 spread actually hits into inversion. So this is also one of the negative things that we note. 
But near-term outlook-wise, based off the negative things like the VIX index and the 2 spread, near-term outlook still remains pretty bullish. And then I'll just highlight uh, some of the more noteworthy uh, recession tracker indicators that we follow that is still kind of a signaling for the upside in the equity market. So this is a TED spread. Uh, basically measures the uh, interbank stress. Uh, falling TED spread tells us all is well within the interbank level. And on the flip side, a rising TED spread shows uh, stress within the interbank level. Uh, basically, TED spread shows you the difference between the three-month uh, LIBOR to the three-month treasury yield. And what we see is that the TED spread continues to move in this flattening trend uh, since hitting the April high of 63 basis point. And especially in uh, August, we actually hit a low of 20 basis point. So all in, as long as the TED spread kind of uh, still remain in this uh, relative range uh, below 63 basis point, uh, I think the equity market should continue to do fine. Uh, again, our study shows that the key threshold to watch for the signaling of the bear market is actually at 1% level. So right now being at around 19 basis point, we are still a far cry away from the 1% level, which is why we are still pretty bullish uh, for the equity market uh, in the near term. Uh, another noteworthy in indicator within the recession tracker is this uh, thing called the ISM Manufacturing PMI, which basically tracks the sentiment of manufacturers. So in terms of why is it interesting is for the month of August, we actually got another significant high at 61.3. And 61.3 is actually the highest level since 1984. So again, another new multi-decade high for the ISM manufacturing PMI, uh, signaling surging optimism within the manufacturers. And right now, we are still not seeing any sign of weakness yet, at least from the manufacturer point of view, despite all the trade tension that has been uh, plastered all over the news media. So in terms of the implication-wise, for the bear market to be signaled by the ISM manufacturing PMI, uh, it needs to hit into a kind of a period of deterioration and more importantly, it's a period of uh, contraction. So these two vertical lines over here shows you the point whereby the ISM PMI actually contracted for two consecutive months whereby it's below 50 for two months straight. And usually based off what we see is uh, once we get a contraction for two consecutive months, uh, it actually signals the end of the equity bull market. Uh, this is, was what happened during the dot-com bubble as well as the GFC period by the two consecutive contraction month actually kickstarted a severe bear market during both periods. So right now, we are definitely not there yet. Instead, we are at a multi-decade high. So near-term outlook-wise, we are still expecting further upside in the equity market until we see a mean reversion lower for the ISM manufacturing PMI. And more importantly, is the point whereby we start to go into contraction. Uh, that should be the point of worry. Right now, I don't think it's a cause for concern. And like I mentioned again, we are still expecting at least another five more months of uh, upside first in the equity market before the 210 spread actually inverts. Uh, the same is true for the CB consumer confidence, which basically tracks consumer sentiment. So right now we are still seeing surging optimism within the uh, sentiment side of things. And again, in terms of number that has been showing up in August, we actually hit a new high of 133.4. And that is actually the highest level since year 2000. So another noteworthy high that we made in August, again, signaling to us for the upside in the equity market. And in terms of signaling the bear market, I think uh, historically it's been proven that uh, for it to start the bear market, the CB consumer confidence needs to actually break below its multi-year uptrend line shown by this point over here, as well as this point over here before the uh, bear market might kick in. So right now, again, we are at the multi-decade high. We are nowhere near the uh, multi-year uptrend line. Uh, in terms of the near-term outlook-wise, uh, based off this indicator itself, we are still pretty bullish uh, for the U.S. equity market, uh, at least in the near term. Same thing is also true for the industrial production number. Uh, we got a new notable high in the month of August, hitting a high of 4.88. And this is actually the highest level since year 2010. So all in with the positive correlation between the uh, industrial production number as into the S&P 500 index, I think uh, as long as we kind of continue to go to the upside, uh, in terms of industrial production number, uh, the equity market in the U.S. can kind of continue to do fine uh, in the near term. And again, the point we worry here for the industrial production perspective is uh, once we dive into period of contraction, I think that's the period where the bear market might actually hit into full force. Right now, with us going at 4.88% uh, on a year-on-year -year perspective, uh, we are still nowhere near the contraction zone yet. So all remains well, at least from the industrial production perspective. And same thing over here from the labor market. Uh, another noteworthy level for the unemployment claims that we saw last week. So last week, the unemployment claims came in at 201,000. And this is actually the lowest level since 1969. And all in again, suggesting that uh, the labor market 
uh, as well as other economical data like I've shown are still all doing pretty decently or in state right now are all at their multi-year extremes. So definitely in terms of the health of the US economy, we are still seeing pretty good growth here in the US equity market. And we do expect this move uh, to the upside to sustain uh, moving forward. Uh, last but not least, I'll just cover the trajectory of the Fed funds rate. Uh, we are expecting uh, the FOMC meeting uh, this week. And right now, the market is pricing in 99% probability of a rate hike uh, this week, which makes it more or less a certainty for the Fed funds rate to be at 2.25% by at the end of this week. And then in terms of the December FOMC meeting, the market is seeing it a 75% chance of another rate hike. So more or less, I think we are definitely going to get two more rate hikes this year. And that will bring the Fed funds rate to 2.5% by end of 2018. And even based off the most recent dot plot projection, uh, the market is still expecting three more rate hikes next year. So all in, as long as the Fed kind of keeps to this pace of gradual rate hike uh, moving forward for this year as well as next year, I think uh, the equity market should do just fine to the upside. Uh, just to highlight in terms of how to read this chart, the blue line is the S&P 500 index. The orange line is the Fed funds rate. And as you can see over here, that is a pretty strong positive correlation here in terms of the movement for the Fed funds rate and S&P 500 index, which means uh, as long as the Fed continues to hike its interest rate gradually to the upside, uh, usually the equity market should rise along with it. And usually the start of the bear market is uh, kind of a signal to us when the Fed goes in the period of inaction with the Fed funds rate. And it's usually the point when the Fed actually cut its interest rate. That is the point whereby the market usually forms its, its top. So you can see over here, the dot com period, this point over here somewhere in late 20, year 2000 was when the Fed starts to cut its interest rate. Uh, that was the point where the market kind of hit into a sell-off in full force. And the same is true during the GFC period, whereby somewhere in October of 2007 was when the Fed cut its interest rate. That kind of uh, sparked the end of the uh, equity bull market and we saw the market kind of uh, tumbling around 50% during that period. So right now, with the rate hike trajectory still pretty much in place, uh, two more rate hikes this year and three more next year, I think, uh, in terms of the movement-wise, uh, the equity market should still do fine until we suddenly get a reversal and the hawkishness uh, from the uh, Fed itself. So covering all the economical data from the recession tracker, I'll just kind of uh, highlight some of the price action that we see, at least for the three main indices, the Dow, the S&P 500 index, as well as the NASDAQ 100. So you can see over here last week, the Dow Jones Industrial Average actually broke another new record high. Uh, Despite it being the laggard, it's finally kind of uh, taken out the January record high of 26,684 points last week. Uh, despite the trade tension kind of escalating last week, whereby we saw US implementing 200 billion tariff on China and then the retaliatory action from China of 60 billion worth of goods uh, from US. But I think the reason why we saw the pop higher for the US equity market was because the market was expecting uh, both tariff of 25% from both China and US. But instead, uh, both countries only slept uh, a 10% tariff on each other and that kind of uh, became the positive thing that the market was uh, uh, focusing on. So right now, price section wise, we are seeing pretty strong uh, uptrend move to the upside with the Dow kind of forming this series of higher highs and higher lows since July. And right now, breaching the January record high, I think the next likely target on the way up should be the big round number at 27,000. And after clearing 27,000, I think the Dow should be aiming for 28,000. And in terms of the price action move, uh, we do not expect the Dow to just go straight up vertically, but instead uh, it should continue to move within this gradual movement to the upside uh, since July, whereby the 20 and 60 day moving average, the red and blue line, uh, should kind of uh, continue to provide like a springboard for the uh, US equity market to the upside, uh, supporting the correction to the upside and bringing the uptrend back. So continue to watch this test stepping motion for the US equity market to kind of uh, take out this 27,000 uh, round number next followed by 28,000 for the Dow. And then the S&P, same thing over here, uh, a nicer uptrend here, pretty gradual. Same thing over here, forming a series of higher highs and higher lows. Uh, with the help of the 20 and 60 day moving average, the red and blue line. And probably just some more noteworthy price action that we saw. Uh, in August, we actually broken uh, above the January record high of 2,878 points. And as you can see, since breaking that record high, uh, the 2,878 points resistance has kind of uh, turned into a support here and kind of uh, helped this uh, correction up in place and kind of uh, reverse the sell off into a period of uh, uptrend. And more importantly, you can see this 2878 point kind of coincided with the 20-day moving average during this period that kind of uh, jolted the market back higher. 
So in terms of the stat stepping kind of uh, bullish formation here, uh, the next likely target for the S&P 500 index should be the big round number at 3,000 points. And I think once we hit this 3,000 point, I think all news media will be plastering this all over their uh, front of their website saying that uh, S&P 500 index will kind of uh, hit this big round number hurdle of 3,000 uh, moving forward. And again, similar price action movement, uh, expect the S&P 500 index to kind of uh, move within this test stepping fashion to the upside. Uh, with the help of the 20 and 60 day moving average acting as a uh, perfect uh, support here. And last but not least, the NASDAQ 100. So pretty much similar to what the price action has been showing for the S&P 500 index, uh, forming this nice uptrend of a uh, series of higher highs and higher lows with the help of the 20 and 60 day moving average. But price action wise, this is setting up kind of uh, pretty nicely for a move higher right now. Uh, again, just to highlight some interesting price action that we saw. So you can see this period over here, as well as this period over here, a correction of around 5% and 4%. Uh, we are seeing a pretty similar correction happening right now over here of around 4% range. And as you can see, the past two examples here where by the sell was around 5 to 5.5%. Uh, 5 .5%. Uh, the blue line, which is a 60-day moving average, kind of a halted the sell perfectly on both occasions. And right now, we are seeing a similar kind of uh, price action happening here. A 4% sell-off that is kind of uh, being rejected by the 60-day moving average. And the current reversal higher kind of suggests to us that the NASDAQ 100 is ready to hit back up uh, into its uptrend. And the next likely target for the NASDAQ 100 should be to retarget the record high of 7,700 points, uh, followed by 7,800 points. And after which, uh, I think we should be targeting the uh, big psychological number at 8,000 points. So in summary, uh, despite the escalating trade tension that we are seeing right now, uh, the economical data, at least from the US, still remains uh, pretty resilient at the amount here extremes. Uh, until we see further deterioration from the economic based data uh, triggering their respective bearish threshold, we remain bullish on the general equity market uh, in the near term. And like I mentioned again, just based off the 210 spread projection, it could still easily take us four to five more months uh, of further flattening before the 210 spread hits into inversion. So near term outlook wise, at least another four to five more months of further upside in the equity market before we head into a period of jittery. And looking at the price action, the current bullish price action in the S&P 500 index, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the Nasdaq 100 uh, continues to just to ask uh, further upside in the equity market uh, for price to kind of uh, search out for new record highs. And what we expect is in terms of price action wise, the 20 and 60 day moving average should continue to act as, as a springboard for propelling the bullish momentum forward. Uh, yeah, and that is more or less uh, the wrap up for the recession tracker for the month of August. Yes, so right now we'll just pause for Q&A if there is any. Thank you. Hi, there's a question on uh, first read and uh, the question is whether when Nippo Karachi stakes in the manager and first read drops to a certain percentage, whether this would trigger the creditor banks to record the loans. Um, so we actually checked with uh, the manager on this and there's, um, there's no worries on this as um, the covenants currently um, are not triggered um, even after the acquisition because uh, as you had pointed uh, out that uh, OU Lipo Healthcare is still under the Lipo Group. So largely, the 20 plus percent is still all under the Lipo Group. So that's what matters. Thanks.
Hi. Um, so there's a question on what what is the where to find the stakeholding percentage of Lipo Group in OU Group. So we do not have coverage on any of the the Lipo companies. I mean, say for First Read or OU Group. So um, but if you like to find the stakeholding percentage, I think the best bet would be in the the respective annual reports or Bloomberg Terminal if you have access to one. Hi, since there are no other questions, uh, we will end the webinar for today. If you have any other residual questions, you may feel free to reach out to us on Stocks PMB. Thanks. Bye.